Can we have a look inside? Yeah. So this is quite an important machine. Um, so if we are to say this is the first personal computer, then this particular machine is serial number three. Apparently, as the story goes, serial number one was sent to Popular Electronics magazine to be photographed. Um, and that's why on the magazine cover, there is something that looks a bit like this, but isn't quite it, because they had to mock it up just before it was published. Number two is owned by a journalist in Silicon Valley, and this is number three. Now, because of the type and the nature of the machine, you know, these things were sort of heavily then modded. You know, people would try to work out ways of adding keyboards or a screen and things like that, and this is no exception. So what you're about to see isn't much like uh, the original uh, setup for a, um, an Altair, um, and it's quite surprising as well. So, here's the big reveal. So, this is the internals of our serial number three, and it's quite drastically different. Uh, for a start, we've got a huge hard drive here, which is very rarely found in one of these machines. So this has been big time upgraded. This is the, the hard drive controller on top and the, the hard drive underneath, or a Winchester drive, whatever you call it. This is a Western Digital one. You know, this would connect to one of these boards. The hard drive controller is over there. And then we have a RAM expansion board. The CPU board is in here. So this one's not even the original 8080 processor anymore. This has actually got a Z80 processor in it now. So this has had a whole load of work done on it, which is kind of the beauty of it as well, because that's what these things were about. We've got another one of these, which is pretty much its original spec. It's a later uh, edition of it, not as low a serial number, but that's original. Um, but this one's got a lot of history, and, and you can see those changes. People are adding boards, um, making it do more and more. People do that today, don't they? That's the fun of all this, yeah. And, and this was so accessible. You know, there, there were no sort of layers of operating systems that you needed to deal with and drivers and things. If you wanted to add another card, you write your drivers for it. Yeah, you know, it's simple as that. You got your screwdriver out and you got your pen out and you write, wrote the code and you bodged something in there somehow. Um, and that was the thing that, you know, firstly, they, they linked a um, serial port to it um, and then you could have a terminal. Then they created keyboard encoders and, and display drivers. Uh, there was a card called the Dazzler, which was color graphics. Um, you know, on a machine that sort of dates back to 75. There was all sorts of things. There's lots and lots of these S100 cards available, um, sound cards, just everything you'd expect today. Um, and you did, you, you probably made these cards, they were uh, supplied as kits sometimes, and you put it together in a configuration that you wanted. It was so open and accessible. The S100 standard was, was they said standard, um, so you could create your own cards, you knew where the pins were, you know, you do what you want with it. Um, and that's why there was so much um, sort of creativity at the time, people creating new things for it, developing new boards, um, and turning this into just, rather than just a basic machine with LEDs and switches, into actually a really usable, you know, business system in some cases with, well in this case here we've got a hard drive, but we have floppy drives, eight inch floppy drives connected to them and all sorts. Um, so yeah, really, really, you know, the, the electronics and software engineers machine of choice. In the States at that time, um, you could buy one as a kit uh, for apparently less than $400. Um, now that would be the very, very basic setup, um, and you had to build it yourself. Uh, but you could then add boards and you know, you know, the, the cost would go up, or you could buy one ready made and obviously more expensive. But then, this was 1975, so $400 then is not $400 now, you know, you're talking, um, I don't know, about $1,800 roughly. So, in yeah. today's money. Yeah, so, quite you know, so this was quite a lot of money and it wasn't just you know, a cheap machine that everyone went and bought. Um, that was a lot of money to find at the time. Um, but people did because it was new and exciting and you know, the beginning of what we know today. Does this one still work? It does do, but being American we need to step down for it. But, uh, but yeah, it does power up and I've never actually toggled in any code because I'm not particularly Z80 based. But it, yeah, it does, it powers up, fan works, you can toggle in things and it does stuff. But I've never really had the time to sit down and play with it much, which is a real shame. Where did you get it from then? eBay. Um, so this was at a time when I was collecting seriously. So, um, I mean, the museum's born out of my collection. Um, I had bought the machines that I owned. I would bought the machines that I wanted to own and couldn't afford. Uh, I started then buying machines that I didn't really recognise. Then I started buying machines from abroad, uh, and it just gets worse and worse, or better and better, depending on which you look at it. Um, and this thing come up, and I'd watched a documentary about computing in the States at that time, um, and this machine was on there, and I was just like, oh, I need to have this bad boy. Um, and I did, and I, I bid on it. Um, I ended up bidding in binary for it, a stupid figure, um, $11,111 or something, um, and got it for a little bit less than that. 
um, but I, I had to have it, uh, especially because of its history and the paperwork that we've got with it that talks about who had it and, and uh, how it came to be. So yeah, it was probably paid quite a bit too much for it, but hey, you know, it's serial number three. I like that you paid binary for it. That's I thought the gods have to be on my side if I do that, surely. And I, th I think there was a guy in Sweden that also had similar figures in his mind, and yeah, it went up a lot further than I thought, but hey, we've got it now. It's really nice because it's that pivotal point in history where you see home computing, personal computing, really start to take off. It had to be in the collection. And then we've had it sat on the back of the shelves on the IT crowd as well, so it's had a little secret sort of stardom. If you look at where Moss is sitting, this thing sits on the shelf behind him, along with some other random stuff as well that we supplied. I think they did another version for the States, yeah, in fact. Yeah. Um, but actually, it's, I mean, when we sort of blogged about it and put it on our website, uh, I think there's a Polish uh, site out there that sent us a ton of traffic. They were big time into the IT crowd. Um, and uh, yeah, they were, they were really quite into that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been picked up quite a few times. It's, it's kind of that in-joke. Um, so... Uh, yeah, the producer um, uh, of the show wanted to have something there that other techies would recognise and go, blimey, that's, that's an out here. That's a real way, you know? And, uh, and, it, and it worked. And, you know, got all these messages coming in that saying, is that actually a real one? You know? And, uh, yeah, so um, now we put it on the show and uh, it's just that little in-joke for them. Comprehensive. Cool, but I'm going to say I'd take him out. I thought I could. So this is the CPU card from it. Like I say, this is a Z80, a Mozatec Z80 in there. Um, and uh, I've got some uh, sort of address decoding and things over here, the uh, ROM there for it. So yeah, you wouldn't normally find a Z80 in an outer, but hey, this one's special. These other cards we have over here, been a like hundred pins on the bus, they're quite hard to get in and out. But um, this one is a serial IO card. So this actually had probably a number of terminals connected to it. We've got one, two, three, four serial ports there. Um, we've got another card over here with more serial ports on it. So you've got six serial ports hung off the end of this. So it's possible that it was doing some sort of concurrent CPM. I wouldn't mind betting. Um, Z80s were good for CPM and, and concurrent CPM. So uh, yeah, I think this was probably so doing some kind of decent business operation. So in this today speak, that means basically they could have had a few dumb terminals where several people were sharing the machine. Yeah, yeah. Logged in at the same time, all using the machine at the same time. Um, a lot of businesses uh, had various forms of S100 computers at that time, Z80 based, and were using it for you know, business database type stuff and all sorts of things. Uh, although the machines were pretty rudimentary, they were still getting them to do quite a lot just doing it in a, in a text-based system. Um, so yeah, they were looking after accounts and all sorts of things. CPM is very much like DOS, so it's all command line uh, stuff. You could do directories of the, what's on the hard drives, you could create word processor files, um, save them, load them, um, different people can be doing different things at, at different times. So that's kind of impressive, really, for that kind of machine at that time. Um, bearing in mind that, go to the 80s, um, and we've got things like the Spectrums and, and uh, other machines out there that are using Z80s, but they're all sing strictly single-user stuff. Um, so previous to that, yeah, they were getting a lot of use out of those uh, relatively expensive and low-power processors. People like Steve Jobs, well, not people like Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs actually saw this machine and, and thought, well, OK, this is a start, but it's not the computer I want this, I want a machine that you can actually type on and comes up on the screen. 